Welcome, everybody, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here as your new Ontario Regional Director. Um, and I want to thank you for being here with us, and I want to welcome you all to Ottawa. And I hope you're enjoying this beautiful uh, city. I'm very sure that uh, folks uh, and Lana from the Auto Bargaining Group are very thankful that this is not the uh, same venue as previous years, so yes. <laughs> Um, I want to start to uh, recognize also all the delegates in the room today um, for really taking the time from your busy schedules to participate in the council and to be here to represent your members. We've had a fantastic few days leading up to this and I can say we have an energetic group uh, who will make this an unforgettable council, so give it up to all of you. And I want to recognize the incredible team of ORC executives and standing committees. And you all have made my transition so seamless. And I want to thank you all for your dedication and your work. I want to give a special recognition to your ORC chair, Sinead Alder. Sinead, your leadership and determination is truly inspiring. Your significant contributions to this council and its members in Ontario are immensely appreciated, and you're an incredible sister, and I look forward to all that we have in store in the year ahead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to the incredible elected leadership team that is here today. Lana Payne, thank you for your guidance, for your support over the last few months. And despite a very busy year, you had time for me, and I appreciate you and all your support. Um, thank you, Len Poye, Daniel Cote, uh, Gavin McGargle, Jan Murray, uh, for being here. And you do so much for our members across the country, and I appreciate your support and for you uh, supporting our council here today. So thank you. I also want to welcome our special guests, um, our Honorable Dr. Jean uh, Augustine and Senator Hassan Youssef, thank you for being here. Uh, Ken Lowenza, Peter Kennedy, thank you for being here. Um, and I also want to welcome uh, your National Executive Board members that are all here today as well. And most importantly, we also want to make sure that we're recognizing the assistants, our directors, our staff, our support staff that are all present here today. Running a union with over 300,000 members involves considerable effort, and the contribution and hard work of everyone involved are invaluable and essential to this, the success of our union um, and this council. I was recently elected to this role this past August at your Canadian Council in Halifax, and let me tell you, it's been a terrific ride ever since. This year, uniform members from coast to coast went up against some of the biggest, most profitable companies in the country and won. The moment that we're in is precious, and I'm proud to say that our union is seizing this moment to create change needed um, and to ensure that every single worker in Canada has what they need to support themselves and their families. Before I begin telling you about the wonderful work we've done and what we'll do together, I want to take a moment to introduce myself to you. Um, not many of you know, but my family immigrated from Saudi Arabia when I was just six years old. Um, we're originally from a country, uh, Eritrea in East Africa, that borders the Red Sea. I see John over there, yes, my brother. <laughs> Eritrea has one political party and uh, according to the Human Rights Watch has some of the most, uh, some of the worst human rights records uh, in the world. From the early 60s to the early 90s, Eritrea successfully fought for independence from Ethiopia. Both sides suffered heavy loss and in those 30 long years, thousands of families were displaced or destroyed um, and gone forever. My mother, um, was confronted with a choice, stay or go. Um, this is something we've all had to consider to some degree at some point in our lives. For my mom, it was between staying in a very dangerous part of the world that happens to be your home, 
or risk everything for a better life. My mother made the brave choice to leave not one, but two countries in pursuit of a better life for me and my two brothers. First, she fled Eritrea, war-torn at the time, and found temporary refuge in Saudi Arabia, where she had me, and then we moved from there to Canada. I want you for a moment to imagine what that would be like, leaving everything you know behind, your friends, your family, material possessions, leaving with hardly more than the clothes on your back and your children, and a whole lot of faith and hopes that you're going to get somewhere and land somewhere better. Being a refugee has taught me a lot about life, the kindness of strangers, without whom I would not be standing in front of you, the strength it takes to survive in a world, especially now as a wealth gap grows and life has become impossibly unaffordable. But above all, being a refugee has taught me that even when everything around you feels entirely out of your control, what you do, how you think, how you feel, and how you love can never be taken from you. I'm incredibly thankful uh, for my life here in Canada, um, for my mom's courage, and for this opportunity to be part of what I know will be an epic year for workers in Ontario. I'd be remiss if I didn't take this moment to talk about what's happening between Israel and Gaza. Because right now, there's a lot of needless suffering in this world, and we're going to need a lot of love to get through this together. Every day that goes by without an end to the war means that there are more innocent people who will suffer or die. It can be very easy to be complacent about this war, to tune it out or get lost in debate. And I'm going to tell you that that's okay, but we must resist the urge to stay there. It's okay to fear war to the point where you can't engage with it. Many of us were also there once. But to be complacent is to be complicit. Each of us must use our power to call for an end to the war and call for lasting peace. We need a long-term solution. Yes, we need a long-term solution. Um, and that solution is a permanent ceasefire. Despite how things may seem on social media or in the news, there is far more that unites us than divides us. We've seen it time and time again this year. Some of the largest, greediest companies around, workers have made the impossible possible. And we did this by putting aside our differences, finding common cause, and working together. Something that we can all agree on is that life has become unaffordable. Rent is high. Groceries are expensive. The cost of everything has gone up. Housing is a fundamental human need and has become an escalating crisis in our province. Ontario is facing a severe shortage of affordable housing and the skyrocketing costs are leaving many families in highly precarious situations. It's a disgrace to see hardworking people struggle to secure stable housing for themselves and their families. It's an utter failure of our governments for allowing the housing crisis to get to this point. In fact, the Ford government has made the housing crisis a lot worse. Instead of creating high quality affordable housing for those who need it most, he's caught scheming with developers and billionaire investors. Instead of bringing down housing costs, he's canceled rent control on new units and gets caught up in the Greenbelt scandal. The housing crisis in Ontario seems like it's the worst it's ever been, and yet the Ford government insists on expanding the current broken system that is not working for working people. How can Premier Ford claim to be for the little guy when he's failing us as workers? How can Premier Ford say he's for people when he sits by while grocery CEOs are gouging customers? And how can Premier Ford say he's for unions when he attempted to strip workers of their fundamental right to strike? It's shameful. 
but our union has a solution. We're going to bargain the best collective agreements ever seen in our province. Together, we're going to hold mega corporations accountable to their workers and demand our fair share of enormous profits. And we'll compel governments to create real solutions to the problems facing working people, not just the rich. And do you know how I know we're going to be able to do that? Because we're doing it right now. We're doing it right now in Ontario. This past summer, we all watched, inspired by the courage of 3,700 Metro grocery store workers who took a brave stand against corporate greed. Companies like Metro keep reporting record profits while also refusing to pay decent pay and work to the very workers who generate those profits. Metro workers had a bold choice to make. Stay here in the wages that don't make ends meet or go on strike against one of Canada's largest grocers. They walked picket lines, rain or shine, for an entire month. When employers let people walk on a line that long, we know what they're trying to do. They're trying to break the strike and break the union. Shame. Shame. Just like Windsor Salt tried to do to our members at Locals 240 in 1959. It took an incredible amount of determination and solidarity to get through that 192-day strike. And it also took community. When our family puts a call out, we respond. At Metro, we stepped in, established around-the-clock picket lines at Metro distribution centers. No trucks in, no trucks out. And well, that got some attention. But that's exactly what it takes to get greedy companies who refuse to seriously bargain to come to the table. And because of their unity and the outpour of public support and your solidarity, workers at Metro got a deal. And that will be used as a standard for future grocery negotiations and not just at Unifor. Since the historic pattern deal at Metro, we've since ratified the pattern deal at more Metro stores. No frills, and then we'll be bargaining in Loblaws in Newfoundland and Labrador this spring. And that's just one of many incredible acts of profound solidarity that occurred this past year. Unifor auto workers ratified an agreement with significant wage increases, pension improvements, and EV transition income security measures, Lana and her team also confirmed investment and product commitments. Because if we keep product rolling off the line, we keep good jobs here in Canada. We partnered with the Tears to Hope Society to raise funds in support of families of loved ones of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, two-spirit and gender diverse people. Hospital workers, while exhausted and burnt out, continue to rally in communities across the province to continue to sound the alarm on the health care crisis that Premier Ford has fast-tracked. The Ford government passed legislation, Bill 60, that allows for-profit private businesses to offer services only once offered in public hospitals, resulting in short staffing, longer wait times, and more closures. Who benefits from such a system? I can tell you it's not users of the public health care system. Everyone deserves access to high quality public health care, not just the rich. That is why we're fighting back against health care cuts and privatization. Once again, we see a government determined on starving the system to near collapse and then pretend to resuscitate it by privatizing it. The staffing crisis in healthcare has only gotten worse. Now, wonderful healthcare professionals are either leaving the field entirely or are being poached by private clinics. 
Wage restate legislation like Bill 124 that Premier Ford is still actively trying to keep intact is a prime example of how this government is both hindering the public system and trampling on the rights of workers. We also have serious concerns about Bill 135, which continues this government's plan to transform the home care sector by privatizing care and removing public accountability. We know that a strong public health care system is the best way to keep Ontarians healthy. We believe that everyone deserves access to high quality care. Profit does not belong in health care. Our tax dollars should go back into the public system, not in the pockets of big business and millionaires. To have great public health care system with exceptional patient care, we need more staff and better working conditions for those staff so they stick around. And so what are we going to do about it? I'm very excited to announce that immediately after taking office, I met with a team of highly skilled member organizers and staff who have been working on a member-to-member -member campaign aimed at connecting with a quarter of our members about their perspectives on healthcare in Ontario. And let me tell you what we heard was shocking. There are many more issues in our healthcare system that you could not even imagine. It's seniors getting upsold medical services they don't need. It's loved ones dying while they're stuck on a wait list. It's healthcare workers burning out because they've been worn thin and overworked for far too long. And here's my plan to fix it. For one, we're going to fight to halt and reverse the privatization of hospital and care services. We need Bills 135, 60, and 124 scrapped for good with no appeals. We're going to do whatever it takes to get more staff and improve their working conditions to reduce wait times, reverse closures, and enhance services. That means taking bold, firm action in a sector where many don't have the right to strike. And we need to compel our government to stop underspending and underinvesting in healthcare. And that means us working together to expose the truth on just how bad it is in healthcare right now. I know communities across our province are ready for it. We recently hosted a series of healthcare town halls in Durham, in Thunder Bay, in Windsor, in St. Catharines, Brampton, London, and Oakville. With more coming in the new year, Community members came together to discuss the current state of healthcare in Ontario. Organizing and experiencing these town halls was a profound experience for me. It's where you get to actually bring people together around a common interest like quality healthcare, and you'd be surprised how much people can find in common with that subject. People sharing their stories about navigating the current healthcare system, sharing what worked well and what failed, it allowed us to recognize that we're not alone in these experiences and there are things that we can do to make it better together. During a time when there's a lot of conflict and division where everything feels so polarizing, the simple act of community members coming together is a significant and crucial step in us finding ways to work together. This is where I feel we make the most progress as a union when we give space for workers to come together, like we're gathered today, and really get down to the issues and share perspectives collectively. Thanks to social media, the sharing of misinformation or straight up disinformation has never been easier. There are little to no consequences to politicians who stoke hateful rhetoric for likes. Social media feels like it's becoming a very dangerous, hostile place. And if you're at all involved in politics because the algorithm knows that conflict will keep you on the platform longer. So certain leaders like Pierre Polyev know and actively stoke fear and division by sharing misleading information and encouraging cultural wars. One such attack has been against queer and trans people. Recently, conservatives and the far right have targeted drag queens and now queer and trans youth to distract us from the real issues. 
The real issue is not drag queens reading stories to children. It is our government not investing in better health care, education, affordable housing, so that every child can flourish. The real issue is not queer and trans youth names and pronouns or parents' rights. It's that queer and trans youth deserve dignity, respect, and to maintain their right to safety in school and at home. As a result of this hateful rhetoric, we've seen a sharp rise in anti-trans hate. We recently mobilized and held a phone zap to support queer and trans youth. Shortly after, Minister Leche began echoing anti-trans rhetoric. A phone zap is essentially a meeting which can be done remote, where everyone calls elected leaders, voice their concerns about a particular topic. And in this case, we wanted the education minister and MPPs know that attacks on trans kids in school was unacceptable and dangerous. By doing this, we've engaged dozens of our members in protecting queer and trans rights and also put Leche and other MPPs on notice. We will not stand by while the rights and the safety of our children are in jeopardy. We also joined thousands in no space for hate rallies and other anti-protests to make clear our conviction to protect queer and trans youth. Because if we don't fight for those rights, we could lose them. They're not guaranteed. Aside from our fight to maintain rights, we're also fighting to expand protections for workers, like through anti-scab legislation. Newly tabled legislation comes after Unifor and other labor organizations advocated for the Liberal government to make good on its promise to ban the use of replacement workers. And now we have to keep fighting to make the tabled legislation into law. We're making a lot of noise about anti-scab legislation because it's a straightforward way to reduce labor dispute durations and protect workers' fundamental right to strike and free and fair collective bargaining. But conservative leader Pierre Polyev has been silent on this, uh, his support on the legislation. And just last week, the Ford government voted down provincial anti-scab legislation. The Ford government had an opportunity to put an end to replacement workers, and they said no. Any political leader who votes down pro-worker legislation is not a friend of labor. The countdown to the next provincial election has already begun, and the campaigning starts now, because there's a lot at stake. Affordable housing, saving our health care system, holding megacorporations accountable to their workers and customers, better legal protections for working people, and decent pay and work. New Stats Canada data shows that the gap between Canada's rich and poor is increasing at a record speed. The rich is getting richer, while everyone else is stuck in this affordability crisis. The least wealthy households are being hardest hit by inflation, and we're seeing record use of food banks in Ontario. This is truly a class struggle between the ultra-wealthy and everyone else. And so we're just not going to, um, sorry, and so we're going to fight back in the best way that we can. We're gonna fight back in the old school, boots on the ground way, the deep organizing, member to member conversation way, the always mobilized way. And if I can leave any legacy here at Unifor, I'd want it to be for my work in organizing. I've seen firsthand the impact that a union can have. I helped organize my workplace, Bell TV, and the difference between having a union versus not having a union is like night and day. And every single worker in Canada deserves the right and benefits of unionization provides. As trade unionists, we're all member organizers. We can tell stories of being supported in our workplace, of having the resources to help us refuse unsafe work, of banding together to stop a ruthless employer. 
But it's not just welcoming new members to our union family. It's about organizing the organized by finding common ground and emphasizing what unites us. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of story sharing, patience, and trust building to get there. But I know that we're all up for the task. We've made a lot of history this year with consecutive bargaining wins, underdog winning against corporate bullies, and the mounting power of workers across this country. And I know the next year is going to be even bigger and bolder. What brings me the most hope for the future of work in Ontario is all of you. Every day I'm out there with our members at a rally or a town hall or a picket line, I'm reminded of why I do this work. I do this work because I know that a better, fairer, more compassionate, kinder world is possible if we work together. When I'm faced with hard decisions in this new role, I'm reminded of the brave choice my mom has made and the risk she made for me and my brothers for a better life. I'm reminded of the collection of people who supported us along the way. You all give me the courage to keep climbing this mountain and the strength to never give up. And I hope you'll join me for each step of this incredible journey because I know we're going to land somewhere better. I want to thank everyone for being here to help us change the world. Thank you so much. Have an amazing council.